I don't know that there was a better song we could sing to set our frame of mind for our lesson this morning. But before I get into that, I want to say to everyone who took part in yesterday, our ice cream and cookout fellowship, that wasn't due to one person or two people. That was due to everybody who came and brought food and supplied and everything. I do think yesterday was a great day. From my perspective, everyone seemed to have a very enjoyable day. It was, as Brother Joe mentioned in his prayer, a great period of fellowship. And if there's one thing that through my years in the church that I've seen maybe fall short in more recent days, it has been this ability of fellowship and getting to know one another. I realize COVID had something to do with that, but Brother COVID, in my mind, and I know it's some spiking in some places, but for the most part, we need to understand COVID is nothing to fear because God knows all our struggles. And we can plan another fellowship, which we will be doing probably sometime in September. Um, the suggestion has been made maybe to do another chili cook-off. Now, Greg did warn me. He said, now, my chili will be quite spicy. I said, that would be okay. There are several here who will enjoy spicy chili. So look for that maybe sometime in uh, September. If you turn to John chapter 11, you can begin in verse 1 and read down through verse 37, really. And you will see a passage about a family. And brethren, this was a family that Jesus loved greatly. We think about Mary and Martha and Lazarus. And as we read through these verses, we can see how much Jesus loved them. And someone may say, Brother Ray, are you losing your mind? Jesus couldn't have loved them like you say he does. When you read the first part of the chapter, he knew that Lazarus was sick. And he could have had every opportunity to go to Bethany. And he could have healed Lazarus from the ailment. But Jesus told, chose another way to show his love. He allowed him to pass from this life and God used that so that he might be able to bring Lazarus back from the dead. To me, that was an even larger or greater show of love than if he would have went immediately and healed him from that disease. And so when I think about this passage, I have to think about my own self today. And I have to ask myself the question, am I able to have empathy? Or am I able to sympathize with those who are going through experiences in life that seem to be tragic? You know, Paul tells us in Romans chapter 12, beginning in verse 15. He says there that we are to rejoice with those who rejoice and that we are to weep with those who weep. Paul was confirming what Jesus did in John chapter 11. Paul was confirming what the Hebrew writer said in, in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15. 
where the scripture says that Jesus suffered in all points in every way that you and I suffer. Jesus went through it. That's why we can sing the song, He Knows Just What I Need. And so, as we think about this idea of Jesus wept, for us today, there are some great lessons that we can learn from this passage. But especially those two words in John chapter 11, verse 35. Charlie, I apologize. I made you had to read so much. <laughs> we have a lot to learn. And I don't have time this morning to cover everything we can learn. But I want to share with you some thoughts about this passage. Point number one, because Jesus wept. Because he wept, his humanity is confirmed. He became the son of the living God who walked upon the face of the earth. His emotions his grief, his groaning, his crying refers to the innermost part of his humanity. I know many of us, especially men, we've heard the song, Big Boys Don't Cry. Liar. Whoever wrote that must not have known Jesus. Because Jesus was a big boy. And Jesus wept. Men, it's okay for you to show emotion. It is okay for you to weep. It shows your inner humanity. Hebrews chapter two, uh, 2, beginning in verse 14. It reveals to us several things about our Jesus. Number one, in verse 14, it says that Jesus died to destroy the devil. Number two, in verse 15 down through verse 17, it tells us that Jesus has released the bondage of sin and death. And then in verse 18, or it tells us Jesus suffered, that he was tempted, and that he overcame it. Jesus wept shows us his humanity. Number two, because Jesus wept, his deity is confirmed. You go back to our text and you look at verse 25 and verse 26 of John chapter 11. Notice what Jesus speaks to Martha. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? I think Jesus knew the answer to those to that question. He knew Martha believed that. But his deity was confirmed when he says that he is the resurrection and the life. It is there that we see the divine heart of Jesus. It is there that we see that he shows that heart for hurting men and women. 
His power over death. It gives that blessed healing and the hope that I hope we all have. But number three, because Jesus wept, it shows that God allows human suffering. Notice I said it shows God allows human suffering. Let us remember that God is not the source of human suffering. Humor and suffering came into existence in the book of Genesis chapter 3. When Eve was tempted by the serpent or beguiled by the serpent. And she disobeyed the one command God gave Adam and Eve. And because of that, mankind, you and I, were cursed with human suffering. If we go back, and I'm not going to take time to turn back to the book of Job this morning, but if you want to see <coughs> human suffering being allowed, and you know about Job, that Job was an upright, that Job was a righteous man. And God and Satan had a conversation as Satan had been wandering the earth seeking one he may devour. You remember, I hope, the words of God when he said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? And you remember how Satan replied? Well, no, I haven't really thought about it because I know you have a hedge of protection built around me. What does that mean, Brother Ray? What does that mean? Satan says to God, you won't let me do anything to him. Because you have these great walls, you will protect him. You won't allow him to suffer. What happened to Job? What happened to Job? He lost everything but his own life. So I said, well, wait a minute, Brother Ray, what about his wife? Well, I said, Satan got to his wife too. And I've had to rethink this over the years. I've rethought that, and Job lost his wife when she looked at him and said, curse God and die. Evidently, Mrs. Job was tired of the human suffering that came about through sin. The fact that God allows human suffering doesn't happen because God is uncaring. It doesn't happen because He's uninterested in you. It doesn't happen because He's unable to respond. And brethren, understand this last one. Human suffering doesn't happen because God is trying to punish you. He's not trying to punish you for what you have done. I say that with great confidence because God loves you. If God was trying to punish you, he would not have sent Jesus into the world to die for you. God, he himself, the almighty one, he is fully acquainted with suffering. We gathered around the Lord's table. God 
had to watch as his son endured great suffering. When we suffer, do we see the big picture? Or do we only see the immediate of what's in front of us? If you and I will look at the big picture, we will understand that our own faith can grow at the hand of suffering. We will see the need to discipline ourselves spiritually if we take advantage of the opportunity. So as the scripture says, let us not grow weary. Let us keep our eyes Focus on the eternal goal of heaven. All the whole book of Revelation deals with that idea. Suffering is going to happen, but we don't want it. Excuse my improper English. Revelation says we don't want Heaven is assured if we'll remain faithful to the end of our journey. Point number two this morning. There are other occasions where Jesus wept and was made sorrowful. And these are the ones that ought to hit each and every one of us. Jesus wept and was made sorrowful when sinners harden their heart and they refuse to believe. Go back to the book of Mark chapter 3 and look at verse number 5. Mark 3 in verse 5. If I can get these pages apart. Maybe I ought to go back to the way I used to do it and put my scriptures in my sermon so I don't have to always turn to them. Mark 3, verse 5. As he was having this discussion with Nicodemus, so when he had looked around at them with anger, or excuse me, not, not Nicodemus, this was when he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath. And he asked the question, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil and save life or to kill? So when he looked around them at, with anger, being grieved by the hardness of their hearts, that word grieved may not say that he cried or he wept, but that word grieved is a strong emotional word that could lead you to believe that he was very sorrowful over their hard hearts, their evil intent, and their lack of faith. How does Jesus weep today when people harden their hearts? Does he weep when they harden their hearts to human tradition rather than the truth of God's word? Does he weep when people give praise to men instead of the glory to God? That's saying that they have a misplaced love. Or does he weep when he sees the deceitfulness of sin? How we so easily can be beset by the trickery of the devil. How about when we're just plain stubborn? Brother Ray, stubborn? Who? You? Oh, wait a minute. Me? How many of you have a 
a stubborn streak in you. Don't raise your hand. I see some of you looking at your spouse. I saw that. If we look down deep in our heart, how many of us have a stubborn streak? Man, how many of you read the instructions after you've tried five times to put something together? If you shake your head yes, you're stubborn. You're stubborn. But that's not the kind of stubbornness I'm talking about. The stubbornness I'm talking about is when someone takes the scripture, the truth of God's word, and it's laid out plainly, and you reject it. That's the stubbornness Jesus weeps at. Jesus also wept and was made sorrowful with his own people, God's people, when they rebel and will not repent. Luke chapter 19, look at verse 41. Luke 19 and verse 41. Now as he drew near, he saw the city and wept over it. Question. What city did he look, was he looking at? What city was he looking at? As he was coming in to Jerusalem for the last Passover he would celebrate. He looks off the side of the mountain and he sees the city of David, Jerusalem. The city where Jewish worship, where honor and respect to God should have been being seen. He looked and he saw that the people had rebelled and they would not repent. Brethren, I want you to know this morning God takes no pleasure in the death of a sinner. This passage proves that Jesus had grief over sinners. God gives his people a season of grace, a period of time for repentance. I know our good brother Kenny is not here this morning. He's preaching at Denmark Road this morning. How many times have you, do you remember Kenny Ross praying for God to give the sinner Space and time to repent. How many, time, how many times have you heard him pray that? Let's see. When's the last time Brother Kenny prayed? I don't know that I can ever remember a time that when he's prayed publicly that he hasn't had that included in his prayer. That's the period of grace that we're asking God to give. But you know, it's not just the alien sinner, but it's God's people. Here, it's God's people. A rebellious Christian. One who has known the truth and turned from it. That breaks God's heart. Jesus also wept and was made sorrowful during moments of great trial. When he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, 
Has he been gone a distance away from the inner three who, remember, couldn't stay awake? You remember his prayer? You, you remember? Oh, wait a minute, let, me, let me back up. Do you remember his condition? What was his physical condition like? Doesn't the Bible say that he had drops of sweat that were like great drops of blood? You tell me that doesn't show the love, the compassion of Jesus Christ. And he got in that condition because he knew of the burden that he was going to bear for you and for me. He knew that he was going to go to the cross. When he went through the circus mockery of a tribe, that didn't prevent his sacrifice. That didn't present his submission to God. I think that all that he went through increased his steadfastness to accomplish the will of the Father just as he prayed in the Garden of Eden. He was emboldened through his faith. He was emboldened by the fact that though he was a son, he learned obedience. And I believe his faith was emboldened because he knew that the Father would never leave him or forsake him. So what are the lessons for us? Number one, you and I must have a heart of compassion for others. When one who has gone down the wayward path and they have left the first love, they've turned their back on the church, how do you show compassion to them? That's, a, that's the best way you can answer the question. Because if you in the back of your mind say, well, you know, they've asked for forgiveness for the same thing several times. I just don't think they want to change. Is that compassion? Or is compassion when they come down Okay. And I look at Jerome. I can't see him right now, but he's out there in the foyer. My brother Freddie. What's compassion? You ask them what compassion is, and they're going to tell you. The compassion was the love that you showed to them when they came down this aisle and you went to them and you hugged them and you prayed with them and you prayed for them. That's the lesson we've got to learn because Jesus set the perfect example for us. He showed us how to do exactly that. Number two, you and I have to trust God when we hurt and when we suffer loss. It's not in our hands. We may not understand, but faith leads us to say, God, you know what's best. We studied Gideon this morning, right? Gideon started with 32,000 soldiers. And God said, 
That's too many. And, and I'm going to use the exact phrase I used in class for those who weren't here. God said to Gideon, you go down and you tell the ones who are too chicken to go to battle. You tell them to go home. 22,000 turned their back on the Lord and walked away. And then God said to Gideon, well, you got 10,000, but that's, that, that's yonder way too many. So he said to ones who drink water the certain way, he said, those are the ones who I'll entrust to go to battle with you, and the number became 300. If God can reduce an army from 32,000 to 300, and they can defeat the Midianites, I know God can handle whatever I face if I put it in his hand. And number three, we've got to live and we've got to believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. First, we must become a Christian. First, we must be baptized into Christ. As many of you have been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ, Galatians chapter 3. But after we become a Christian, we know the demand is that we live a faithful life. That we walk in the light as He is in the light. That we grow spiritually, we mature spiritually day by day by day. Spiritual maturity does not come instantaneously. It takes time. A weeping Jesus, it assures us that God cares for us. A powerful Jesus assures us that God will raise us from the dead. The same Jesus who came forth from the grave triumphantly, he can raise us, as Paul says, out of the depths of sin. <clears throat> Romans chapter 6. And a Christ who reigns in heaven assures us that judgment will come one day when he comes to take us home. Jesus wept. What do we weep over? Are you weeping over the fact that you're not a Christian? That ought to grieve your heart. Because without Christ, heaven will not be your home. Or this morning, if you've wandered away, your rebellious, sinful life, Jesus is weeping for you today because he wants you to come home. This morning, if you have a need to respond to the invitation, we pray you come and stay.